<laughs> All right. I did write a book on this. It's called In Business with Beans, and it will be out in a week or 10 days, depending on somebody else besides me. Uh, and it is basically, basically, it is. Once you decide that you want to start making money with your beat, I bet you everybody in here has a spouse that said, I thought we were going to make money with this. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. We never thought that. No. <laughs> we did it purely for altruism. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> yeah, right. whether you've got five colonies and you want to make enough to buy another beat <coughs> next year, or you've got 500 and you want to quit your day job, that's what this is about. And it's, uh, a whole bunch of different ways to make, make your bees pay their way. And I'm going to go through this fairly fast because it's kind of long. But uh, I, what, I, what I want to do is just leave you with some ideas of things that you may not have thought of that your bees could do and you could do with your bees to generate some income. And like I guess I'm going to go through this fairly fast. But, but <clears throat> there's, 100 and there's more than 100 ways that your bees can, can make money for you. Put your head to it and, and think about what it is they do, what it is you do, and what it is you do together. And so just kind of listen and, and let these ideas flow because you're going to come back and, and an hour you're going to go, yeah, and? And that's what I want you to do is yeah, that and because you're going to think of things that I don't think of because you have different customers that I've been to, you have a different environment, you have different, you're in a different world than I am, but a lot of what we do is similar. So take these ideas, make some notes, and, 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 and think of them. I was in, I was in Dandelion Bee Supply yesterday, and I think they're from there. And I saw a lot of going on there that you're going to see here today, but some things that weren't going on there that, that you'll see here today. And I'm hoping that he's going to go, God, that would be so sad. And you could do the same thing. He said, I, I wouldn't have to do anything extra and I could make more money. That's what I want you to think about. So, um, mostly what happens when people get this is you've got a hobby, you've got two, two colonies in the backyard, and then you've got 12 colonies in the backyard, and then you've got 20 colonies in the backyard, and then you've got three bee yards, and your spouse is saying, I thought you were going to make money doing this, and then you have to get serious about this. And that, that cycle is real familiar a lot of people who are, most people don't start with 50 colonies in, in a store. Most colonies, most beekeepers work into it. And that, I'm going to guess, is probably your, your experience also. So before you, before you get serious about where are you now, where do you want to be, and how are you going to get there? And those are the three questions. This, I, this isn't beekeeping, this is any, any business. You know, if you're, if you're going into landscaping, if you're going into whatever kind of business you're going to go into, where are you now, where do you want to be, and how are you going to get and those are the questions you have to ask. So when you, where are you now? Do all of these things. You know, what, what, what do you have? What do you, what's your stuff? And, and write it down. And the, the key point of this is writing it down. Uh, have a list. Because you're going to have to show this list to 87 bankers and 14 financial people. So the sooner you write it down, the better your job you do, the better you're going to be able to answer questions. So, you know, once you piece up your job and your other commitments, your honeydew list. Uh, I have a really long honeydew list. Family and future and family commitments. You got kids who are going to college. Can they help you? You got kids in high school. That sort of thing. You have you have business commitments other than your job and your family. Uh, what do you have for PRs? And can you pay your credit card bill every month? I mean, these are all the things that you just have to know. Just really common sense things. But um, write it down because somebody's going to ask you that question. Sooner than, sooner than later. Where do you want to be? And I want to be big enough. I want to be big enough to put my day job. I want to be rich. You know, um, and, and, and being rich and keeping bees does work. I know rich beekeepers. And they got rich because of what they're doing with their bees. So it does work. Not as often as I like to see it work, but it does work. So you can get there from here. You gotta get everything out of those bees with the buzz. And if you can get that too, that's better because if there's some way you can sell out buzz, and you know a way you can sell out buzz is when you tie that drone on. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. 
drivers come in and, and, and entertain their children. We get money from that bus. So keep that in mind. Um, I want to get everything but well, at least enough to break even whatever. You know, what's your goal? And how can you get there? And what, what, what's your goal? You gotta have a really clear, well-defined goal. I wanna be able, I wanna be here. I wanna be debt free, I wanna be great, whatever it is. Um, so what can you do with a high of bees? A camera, a hundred. And and you can make money with a high of bees, and you can certainly make money with a hundred or money with a hundred. Honey production might be your goal. That's all. I just want to be a beekeeper. I just want to make honey, extract it, put it in barrels and pails and bottles and so on. That may be your goal. That's perfect. Except, I'm not going to go through this, but basically what it comes down to, in the honey market in the U.S. last year, last year 2017, uh, $318 million was made with honey in the United States. And, and $19 billion was made in pollination. Where are you going to put your energy? And I, I said this earlier this morning, uh, I can make honey for $250 a pound and put it in barrels, or I can make bees at $30 a pound and put them in, cage, in, in cages. Where am I going to put my time and energy and resources? And I may be in a place that I can make honey without even thinking about it. My bees just make 150 pounds per colony every year, every year, every year. That may be where you stop and start, where you start to stop. But if it isn't, if you're making 40 or 50 pounds a colony, maybe bees is a better choice for you, or some combination of bees is a better choice. But, but know that 80% of the honey consumed in this country comes from offshore. You got, that's your competition, is you're, you're competing with beekeepers in Vietnam and India and the Ukraine and all of these places who will sell it. I can buy honey by the barrel from Vietnam today at 97 cents a pound. Mm. That's your competition for honey. So you know, if you know that going in, you know what packers are looking for. They're not looking for $2.54 honey. $2.54 a pound, they're looking for 97 because it sells on the grocery store shelf. It sells, still sells for seven bucks a pound, no matter where I got it. So, Know that going in, and you'll, you'll at least be uh, prepared. 1950, honey was about 90% of the commercial beekeepers income, in 2017 it was about 20%. That's where commercial beekeepers are making their money. They're making so money on, on honey, but the, because of the price of honey, because of the competition, they're taking a step back and saying, what else can I do with a high full of bees? And, and here you are, you see the trend. If you know it going in, and you know the competition is going to be stuff, stuff and sit, and you've got a market for your local, local, local honey that has rival implications to it, you're going to be okay. But if you just make a honey by the barrel, this is the kind of thing that you're going to have to be aware of. Uh, in the Dakotas, this is Richard Davies' farm in the Dakotas. On a good year, he could make 200 pounds on a colony on an average year of 100. On a bad year, Right today, it takes 166 pounds of honey per colony to break even. <coughs> to break even. Can I lose 100 pounds of colony? And let's see, I'm going to lose money on every colony. Unless I've got some other income coming in from that colony, which, by good fortune, you do. You can be a pollinator. And you can take your <laughs> money to Las Vegas because your honey money, your honey money is a bad. A bad year, if you're running, if everything you're doing is, is, is based on honey, you are taking your money to Las Vegas. You are betting that it's going to work. You're betting on the weather, you're betting on the market, you're betting on uh, uh, colony collapse, you're betting on pesticides, you're betting, betting, betting. You are dependent on the weather when it comes to honey. And if you're looking at doing this, take your money to Vegas, the odds are better. They really are. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll go back to you. If you're sitting in a place where I'm not spending any money to make 150 pounds of colony, go for it because you'll, you'll make a living doing that. But if you're starting out and you're looking at and hoping the weather cooperates next year, uh, you've already seen this one. <coughs> We're made in the corn and concrete. The, there is less and less available land, and the present administration is looking at the Geography, the forestry department, and they're taking more land out of there. They're looking at, at uh, conservation reserve land, they're taking land out of that, and they're giving it back to farmers, saying farmers should have ability to raise more crops and make more money, and all of that land that they're taking out of 
of uh, what was pine beach production is now going into corn and soybeans. So there's going to be even less land out there coming up in the near future. Uh, and there are things that, that, are, that your competition is doing, and you know that your competition is doing, not necessarily from the US, but from overseas. They're blending, they're blending their crop. What you get is you, what comes out of the extractor. Maybe it's a bride or somebody who was kind enough to give me some, some sour wood honey this year. It's coming out of the extractor, but if you just got a whole season's worth of But other people are blending the color, high moisture, bad flavor, change the color. I got dark, I got light, I want something in between because that's what the customer wants. I'm changing the flavor. Maybe I'm adding pollen because I don't know where this stuff came from, and I want to make sure that when somebody checks the pollen, it comes from North Carolina pollen plants as opposed to something from Korea or India. Uh, I'm over, I don't, not, I'm overheated a bunch, so I got a, a disco bottle of that flavor, I'm diluting the bridal content. What is, what is uh, orange blossom honey? How much honey from orange trees has to be in a jar to be orange blossom honey? To be able to say on the label orange blossom honey in there, and I, uh, how's your ethics? 51. He says 51%, and there's a lot of people that would agree with you. There's other people that say predominantly orange blossom honey, and that's a legal definition. So I could have I could have honey that's that's 21% orange blossom honey, and it could be 20% four other things, and it's predominantly orange blossom, and I can say it's orange blossom legally. So where's your ethics? So therein lies another uh, point of competition from other people that you're dealing with when it comes to orange blossom honey. If yours is pure, and you say orange blossom, and this guy's 21%, he can say orange blossom too. Who's getting, and it's costing him a whole lot less to produce this than it did in the pure. So these are the things that people are doing to dumb down the, the value of honey that you're competing against. Uh, and we are our own worst enemy. What's in honey coming? Have you read the, uh, the reports that just came out, I want to believe about a week ago, about the amount of honey that was found with glyphosate, Roundup in it. Uh, you sell them honey with Roundup in it, and how do you know? I, I, I'm, I'm being particularly negative here, because, because there's a lot of things going on in the honey market that if honey is going to be what you want to do, you need to be aware of so that you can, you can, you can stop that argument before it ever starts with your customers or the people you want to sell to. You gotta know what else is out there. And there's a lot of bad things out there that are gonna make your life difficult if honey is gonna be your business. I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but if you know all of the enemies out there before you start, at least you'll be prepared to deal with them. And then how big do you wanna get? If you've got 100 colonies, you're gonna leave it at 100 colonies? Uh, and, and, and you really concentrate on, okay, if I'm working 100 colonies full time, I know that I can do a better job. I know that my bees will be better, healthier, they'll make more honey per colony, all of these things, and that's the decision you have to make. How much can I afford to invest in this? Do I have money set aside? Do I have friends or family that can lend me or give me money? Do I have uh, small business administration or USDA loans that I can get to, to expand my business. And these are all of the things that you're going to be talking about, bankers and, and government people and all, all manner of people once you decide you go to this direction. So how big do you want to get? And if your goal is to be Richard 80 out in South Dakota and California and have 100,000 colonies, you've got a long ways to go, but you could get there. If, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to be uh, Roy Henderson when he had about 70 colonies, you can get there and make a living at it. But he did 70 colonies really well. So know where you're going to know where you're headed and how big you want to get. And there's nothing wrong with being small. That room, when you see the diagram for on the lower right, left hand corner is a, is a bathroom and a basement. And that's how big this guy got. And this is what he was doing in that basement. He was making a lot of stuff in that basement. A lot of stuff. He was working full time. He was making candles and soap and lotions and potions and and beeswax and honey and all of this is what he was doing in a little tiny spot. He had no room to grow. He was in his basement at the finite space. But he was able to make all of this stuff and do all of this work in his basement and make it work for him. So it can be done. So how big do you want to get? And, and you can be small and make it work, but you're going to be working full time. And that's maybe where you want to go. Uh, 
Uh, we talked about the bridle, and I'll, I'll think, uh, we'll just skip this because we already talked about that, but what is bridal honey really? And, and if you're going to be selling bridal, then, then you be prepared to back up your definition of it. Uh, these are bridal crops around Ohio that we have. Uh, I mentioned our holiday honey, uh, goldenrod and locust and, and basswood, and we have a purple loose gray. Let's see, you've got a purple loose gray here. You see purple loose gray, pure purple loose gray honey, looks like 10 of the 30 more of It's a green. Um, it's a real surprise the first time you find it. But, we, and then we have the clovers, like a sweet clover. But we can make pretty good bridal honey crops of this in Ohio. I can stop, I can start to stop and isolate a pretty good crop on these things. Uh, and then there's artisan honey. That's everything at the end of the season, what I call artisan honey. And I'll cover your place and slap your hands if you call it wildflower. <laughs> get, rid of, get rid of wildflower honey. Because my wildflower honey in Ohio tastes a whole lot different than your wildflower honey here in North Carolina. And a consumer is going to go, wildflower, well, this is dark, and this is, well, this is strong, this is <clears throat> wildflower doesn't mean anything to anybody except you because you haven't thought about giving you a name. So instead of calling it wildflower, give it a name. Let's take a look at this for a second. <clears throat> You can have mixed crops, same season crops, simultaneous. You have all sorts of things. Your honey is all sorts of things. You can have a spring blend, a summer blend, and a fall blend, and that's what you can call it spring blossom, summer blossom, fall harvest. You can give it a name because that way your customer is going to know that the spring blend is different, there's something different, and then you can explain it to them. Spring is going to be light, summer is going to be a little bit darker, fall is going to be darker, yeah, it's going to be stronger. All of these things are going to make differences. So if you can give it a name, uh, give it a season name, uh, or a location name. Uh, uh, Cabarrus County Honey. I'd get that word right. Cabarrus County Honey. It's going to be different than the county next door. A, it's going to be local. People know where it's going to come from. But I'm going to bet you it tastes different because there's different crops growing here and there. And so you can, you can look at that. But, but, it's, but all of these things are blends of all different kinds of honeys. They're not varietals honey. And, and, and if you give them a name, you give your customers a way to identify them, and you can get rid of wildflower. Get rid of wildflower. <laughs> you can also give your honey names uses. Perfect for barbecue, or perfect for whatever, bacon, tea, toast, whatever you can use honey for. And you can give it that name. You can give it flowers, perfect barbecue honey. That tells people what it's for. What do I do with honey? Well, you use it barbecue sauce, right? It tells you right there in the label. It tells you where it came from with my name, and it tells you what to use it for. So you can get, excuse me, you can get creative that way and begin to give people ways to use your honey that they're not thinking of on using other people's honey. So that honey did this. Uh, they're, starting, they're starting to sell honeys that are useful for a lot of different reasons. Uh, English breakfast, sweet lion blaze, vintage year. This is a good one, vintage year. Uh, we've got, we got a guy back in, in, in Ohio that sells vintage honey. And he gives it just, it's, it's everything. He doesn't call it wallflower, it's just everything at the end of the season. And he buzzes 2018. Buzzes 2018 honey. And that's what he calls it. And, and so somebody buys a bottle of his 2018, and next year they're going to come back and they're going to go, oh, I had some of your honey last year. That 2018 was so, you got any more of that? And he's going to go, I got, I got one left. What do you think it's worth? <laughs> so, give people a reason to buy it and have, give people a way to identify it. And if you count a wildflower, it's all the same. And, and they're your wildflower, my wildflower, the wildflower, it's on a grocery store shelf. But by giving it 2008, buzz is 2018, they know exactly what it is, and they know exactly where to go get it. Uh, infused honey, and, and this is beginning to take off. This has always been around, but it's beginning to take off. And this thing, buzz makes this stuff. Uh, I think that half a bushel of very, 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 very hot peppers. Grind them up, put them in a bag, and you'll put that bag in a 
bottle tank and let it sit for about a month. And all of the moisture and all of the flavor from the peppers is absorbed out or taken out of the peppers and absorbed by the honey. And this stuff hurts. <laughs> <laughs> but people love it. And because it, because it has that added flavor, it has that added value, he's able to charge enough for it. What did it cost him? It cost him a bushel of peppers. That's what it cost him. He's almost doubled the price of a jar of honey because of it. And he makes you taste it before you buy it. it because he doesn't want you to bring it back because it hurts. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of things you can infuse honey with. And, and all of them work. And you can change the flavor, you can add to the flavor, you can enhance the flavor. Uh, citrus peel works really well. Just peel two oranges and put it in a, in a gallon jug and let it sit for a week. And you get that, you get a hint of orange in your honey. Or you can do the same with lemon. Or there's a thousand things you can infuse honey with. And they all work and they all change the flavor and they all do something that nobody else in this room is doing. And now you gotta lay up on it because you can say infused with and uh, suddenly it has added value. Uh, who here sells honey for a living? Or at least sells honey? How much does it cost you to make a pound of honey? Oh, me? Who here knows how much it costs to make a pound of honey? A bunch. It cost me a bunch and a half. Therein lies the issue. What does it cost you? The guy in the grocery store knows what that jar costs when he puts it on the shelf. It costs him five dollars and he's going to sell it for at least nine because he knows it costs him five. If you don't know how much it costs, how can you sell it and make money? You're selling it what the other guys sold it for or what the grocery store guys will give you for it, right? What, what was it at the farm market last week? That's what we'll sell it for. What was it in the grocery store? That's what we'll sell it for. Therein lies the biggest issue this industry has is what does it cost to make a pound of honey? And if you can't figure that out, then you shouldn't be selling honey because you're giving your money away, maybe. Or maybe you're making a ton of it. But if you don't know, how can you, how can you tell your accountant what your cash flow is if you don't know what it costs you to make a pound of honey? You can't do it. So therein lies the issue with pricing. Find out your costs. And if you, I'm going to bet you a nickel that if you put down, sit down and talk to everybody in your family and everybody that was associated with your business last season, the people you were selling to, the people you were buying from, you look at what you bought for your business, what you sold, you can talk and sit down with an accountant and I bet you can figure out how much the honey you sold last year cost per pound and what you sold it for. It's pencil and paper time, but you got to do it. Because if you're selling honey at seven dollars a pound in the case of twelve, and it's costing you eleven dollars a pound in the case of twelve, how fast can you shovel money out the door? Am I right? Because that's what you're doing. So marketing and pricing and labeling are all important. But pricing is a big one. What does it cost to produce a pound of honey? <coughs> and here's more on local honey. Rather than twelve bar, sell local honey, U.S. honey, bridal honey, location honey, useful, infused, vintage. Seasonal, pure honey. Give it value. Wildflower honey has no value. You, by giving it a season, a name, some, some Artisan. special Artisan. recognition, are giving it value. Therein lies the reason to charge more than your neighbor. Is because you've added this to your honey, this special property to your honey. Like the year. Uh, all nation. <coughs> That's what the money is in beekeeping. Right now, 80%, 20%, right? So if you're looking to make money, and, and, and this is a way to do it. I don't know what the pollination business is. I don't know what agriculture is in this part of North Carolina, and maybe this is unrealistic. It's, it's barely realistic in my part of Ohio, unless I want to travel more than half a state away. I can do that. But, and I can make pretty good money, because there just aren't enough beekeepers who want to put bees on the trailer and move them. So I can make pretty good money, and, and, uh, but I, I, I'm not going to have a 9 to 5 job. I'm going to be doing it full time, and I'm going to be doing it with enough reason to make a count. But, so you got to, if, if, if you're looking at pollination as a job, as a business, you've got to know what crops and how many of them are there and what the competition is and what it's going to take for you to get into and stay into that business. Uh, we went through this. Um, pollination 
is what beekeepers are making money on, honey isn't what beekeepers are making money on. But once you decide to do this, boy, you got to know what you're doing. you got to know yourself. Uh, are you a good enough beekeeper? Do you have enough money for equipment, for insurance? What if you lose half of your colonies uh, in, in, in December? Are you going to have to be able to replace them by the time their crop blooms in, in March? Do you meet the schedules needed nights and weekends? Do you have the necessary labor? What do you pay them? How about liability and workman's comp insurance? All these questions got to be answered before you pick up that first colony and put it on the trailer. It can be done. Lots of people do it. It can be done, but that's what you got to do if you're going to put bees on a trailer and move to somebody's crop. Uh, what happens if you uh, blow a tire on that truck and that those bees squirm and somebody gets hurt with your bees? Are you covered? You're in a business of it. You're not. Unless you already got that covered as a business. So all of these questions you need to have to ask uh, before you set, pick up that first colony. It is a good way to make money, but there's a lot of preparation you need to get there. You got to know your crop more than your growers do. Um, if you can't tell, if you can't tell me what the three worst pests of apples are in North Carolina, you should be pollinating apples. Because if you know the three worst pests, you know when they're going to raise their ugly little heads and when the farmer's going to spray. And if you don't know when you're going to spray, you're not going to know enough to ask the farmer, can I get my bees out of there first? So you've got to know the crop better than the grower. So do your homework before you ever start. Because otherwise they're going to the well, farmers are going to go, well, yeah, you didn't know, and suddenly you've got 40 dead colonies. He may be liable or not putting it in your contract. We're going to talk about that, but <clears throat> you've got to know your crop better than the, than the grower does. Everything that I just said is going to be in a contract, and that is not a contract. I don't care if you've known this apple grower your whole life. I don't care if that, that apple grower is your brother. <laughs> do not do this because you don't know what's going to happen two days from now. If your brother dies, what happens to those bees that are out in his apple orchard? Do you know? You don't. I mean, a number of several things could happen. This is not a pollination contract. Do not do this. I mean, you may, after you sign your pollination contract, shake hands, but do not leave your contract viable uh, on that. I'm going to go through a whole bunch of points here on things to put in your contract. And <coughs> Who's participating? The number of colonies, the delivery dates, the price, with premiums and penalties, payment schedule, placement of alternatives, where do you load and unload, uh, where's the crop, uh, there's more. Delivery date, the set bloom, minimum notice. The guy call you up at 10 o'clock on Tuesday night, say, can you have it here Wednesday afternoon? And no, I can't. So what do you do? Uh, removal date. When you get that one out of there, what about, whoops. One more time. Uh, what about conflicting dates? What if you say to this apple grower, I'm going to be here from here to here, and you got a cucumber grower over here, and I'll be from here to here, but the apple crop is late. And it comes in seven to ten days later than it normally does, and suddenly you have to have cucumbers, uh, colonies, but they're over colonies are still sitting in apples. What do you do? You got a contingency plan? You got extra colonies? How are you going to make that work? What do you do? Uh, pesticides used, as I was talking about, what are the, what are the pests on apples? Uh, if, you got, <coughs> if you got a second crop, a lot of cucumber growers in, in Ohio have a crop coming into bloom 10 days later, another crop 10 days later, another crop 10 days later, another crop. Five days later, another crop because the weather got warm. How do you deal with that? And, and do you have enough colonies and do you have it written into your contract? What happens if uh, I have no bees? Can I take my contract and give it to him and let him fill that contract? Does the contract allow that? Insurance. Who's responsible? Who's responsible if somebody steals your bees out of his orchard? Who's responsible if your bees sting some passerby and that passerby dies or kills one of the grower's people or one of your people? Or one of the growers' tractors runs over one of your people. Who's responsible for all of these things? Legal damage during contract one besides the payment, this has to spray stuff for vandalism, uh, liability to the public. What happens if the grower says, I need you to bring enough bees and I'm not paying you? Period. Make me. How do you handle that? Uh, can I get to my bees to take care of at all times, night and day? Or is there a bees? Or are they locked? Beekeeper out of California have one of those great big chain bolt cutters. It's a universal task. 
Because he, has, he has to give in and feed. And he has to give in to feed right now because I have no feed more means the rest of the tonight. Bang, goes a lot. So that, that makes it work for him. Uh, pesticides are a problem, especially the fungicides and growth regulators and growers are using now. They weren't using even three years ago. You will get sprayed in, in a lot of crops, and you will not notice it because it doesn't hurt your adult bees, but the stuff that they bring back and store in the colony will kill larvae in about three weeks. Mm. So you, you're in an apple orchard or an almond orchard and things look fine. Your bees get sprayed with this stuff. You take them out and suddenly you've got a whole generation of bees dead on the floor. What happened? That was three weeks ago. What do I know what happened three weeks ago? And, and you don't know what happened three weeks ago. So suddenly you have to deal with that kind of a problem. <laughs> Uh, still more points. Penalties. What if you fail? What if you don't have enough fees? What if he doesn't? Uh, the grower doesn't do what he's supposed to do. Active cows. What about a tornado? Comes through, tears up half the orchard and half your hives. You just, you know, go, oh well, and wish it hadn't happened and go home? I don't know. Uh, if, if there's a problem with the contract, who's the arbitrator? Uh, like I said, what if the apple grower dies? And your bees are on this property, and, 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 and the estate is tied up until it's settled, and your bees are sitting there all summer because two lawyers can't make up their mind, and you can't get your bees out of them and go make honey. And they sit there and starve because you didn't handle it with a. What about safe, uh, safe water? A contract should specify that the responsibility for the colony or pollinating is solely the growers, not yours. Or it's solely yours, not the growers. That's decided in the contract. This is, this is why beekeepers make a lot of money on pollination, but this is why it's a lot of headache, because there's a lot of legal stuff that you don't make sitting in the field making honey. You make more money on pollination, but you don't have nearly the grief that you do uh, if you're making honey. But if you don't go in, if you're, there's a, there's, there's a thousand pollination contracts on the internet as examples of questions to ask. And if you're thinking of doing this, hit all thousand of them, because everyone's going to be a little bit different. But by the time you're done, you will have asked all of the questions you need to ask. Ah, uh, how much do you charge? How much do you charge? Pick a colony up, put it on a trailer, about 25 miles down the road, set it off the trailer, and come back in 10 days and get it. What's it worth to you? How much do you charge for honey? You've got to know both answers. And, and here's a way to figure it out. You know how many, you, you, if you sit on a paper pencil, you can figure out how much time and resources I spent getting 100 colonies to this point. I started, starting last fall, I got them through winter, I got them through spring, I got them on the trailer, and now I know how much all of that cost me. I can figure that out for 100 colonies, divided by 100, that's my cost per colony to get it to this point. I take that colony, I put it on the trailer, and I drive it 25 miles, and I'm going to charge you so much per mile and so much time, and now somehow I've got cost plus transportation. That's my price. And that's a, that's a good way to look at it, because you've separated this cost, which is getting it alive, and that cost you can transfer to making honey. That's part of your honey. If I, get, if I can get that number, how much it costs me to get my colony in the spring, I can tell you how much to charge for honey, because I know how much that colony costs me. You can do the same thing with this. I can put it on a trailer, I can get a cost, and then it's going to cost me, I have to go there three times to check out during pollination, there's a cost for that, and I come up at the end of the day with a figure that's going to cost you per colony, and you're not going to go broke. That's how you do that. You end up with a two-phase price. I rent my colonies for this much, and I'll transport them for this much, and that's what you're going to pay me at the end of the day. And, and then you know. You know how much your business is going to cost you at the end of the day, and if the grower doesn't want to pay it, then, then are you going to give it away anyway? No. Well, I hope you won't. But uh, most of us aren't running 100 or 1,000 colonies. Uh, those are my bees, mostly acreage. We don't make any money. We, my bees and my chickens are the same thing. It's how fast can I spend money to keep them alive? <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's, but, but if that's not your goal in life, your goal in life is to have at least be, you know, the spouse thing, I thought you said this was going to make money, if that's your goal here. Um, there's a lot of things you can do on a small scale. 
you're not going to put 80 colonies on a trailer, you're not going to make a thousand pounds of honey, but you can do things like this. You can make candles and you can collect pollen and you can make potions and potions and you can eat Easter eggs. All these small things you can sell. You can either have a place of your own to sell them, a small shop where you can sell them to a guy who has the shop and doesn't have the time to do these small things because he's doing bigger things. And that is a really good way to get started in this business, is to work with somebody who's already in this business that doesn't have the time or the resources to do the stuff you want to do, stuff like this. That works really well, because then you can see how a bee business is going to work. Uh, honey bee removal. Uh, we have friends in, in the Atlanta area who were doing this for a lot of years and making good money. And if you live in Florida, two things in Florida I want to uh, bring up here. I was in, in Palm Beach earlier this year, and the meeting I was at, there were two people there who were making a living custom extracting. That's all they did. They extracted honey for other beekeepers. Because down there, they can make, they can make honey 365 days a year. And I, as a hobby beekeeper, can't extract 365, so they were making a living extracting honey for other beekeepers, keeping a portion or getting paid to extract it. Kind of the same thing here. If they're down south, we are removing bees all the time because of that organization. So one of the things to think about in your honey house is you've got a very piece of equipment, expensive equipment sitting over here that you use four days a year, that extractor. What's it doing the other 361 days? Collecting dust. Why not put it to use? Why not hire somebody to do custom extracting for other customers? He gets paid, they get the honey, you get some of the honey, and you're out nothing. There is a way to make money with equipment that isn't being used. And, and uh, honeybee removal is another one. You've got to know a lot of stuff about buildings and carpentry and all of those things. And I know none of those things. A hammer in my hand is a lethal weapon. But <laughs> if you're good at this, you can be good at, at, at removing honey. You can have you can get as big as a store and, and have all the things that you need. You can be a dealer for any of the major manufacturers. You can get bigger and bigger and bigger. You can, you can uh, produce packages or sell packages for other people. You can raise your own queens. You can do shows. You can always, you can always be selling beekeeping. You can be doing custom, custom classes. You can teach people to make candles. You can teach people to make motions and potions. And then sell them the stuff to make motions and potions with. These are all things that are not really out of pocket. Um, they're kind of pay as you go. So a lot of this works if you've got a, if you've got a space that doesn't have to be big. It can be a small space, and it works. You can produce your own queen uh, and sell seasonally or all year long. If you're going to produce your own queen, we've already talked about drones and all the things you have to deal with drones to do that. And you produce your own queen. Does anybody here produce queens for sale? What happens when you go down to Joe's bee store and buy a queen and she's a dud? Get your money back? No. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have a taillight guarantee. I'll, I'll guarantee that queen too. I can't see your taillights. And, and that's it. And that's usually it. But can you make money teaching people how to beginner's class and say, you take my class and I'll sell you a queen and I'll replace it for free if it goes bad. But they took your class. Can you do that? Could you do that? Yes, you could. And you could, then you could offer a year because you taught how to take care of bees. If they know what you know, the probability of failure goes way down. It's not zero, but it goes way down. If you could be teaching that class, because then they know what you know. And you know what kind of questions to ask them. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And they're going to know that they should have, or they didn't, or whatever. But you can do that. What kind of a guarantee? Well, maybe none, but maybe some of them. Work it for that. You can be selling bees, loops, packages, queens, bulk bees. Uh, <clears throat> and there again, am I raising my bees to make honey or am I raising my bees to make bees? And if I go one direction, I can make enough bees to make summer splits and spring splits. I can make a split this summer and then I can get that split and split it next spring. And I have one colony last summer and now I've got four next spring to sell. You got to be doing this full time. But it works. You can make you can, you can really push your bees and make enough bees to, to sell a lot and still replace what you lose yourself and have enough to sell. Packages. What, what happens to packages when you buy packages from, from Georgia or from Northern California and it goes belly up? You're usually out of luck, right? 
Well, again, I'll go back and teach you people a beginner's class on how to take care of a package. Take my class, I'll sell you a package full price, and I'll replace it at half price if it, does, if it fails. If you do what I say, it won't fail. And if you have to replace a few, you replace a few. But you're still making money because you're teaching a class. They're buying their equipment from you, they're paying you to take the class, and you're making money there, and when that, those few packages fail, you replace them with free. Because you had some extra anyway. You had, you had 500 ordered and you ordered 550. You got, still got to sell them. So this is your replacement packages. You can sell nukes over winter, spring splits, all the ways you can sell nukes. Uh, same way. Making splits, summer, late summer splits and spring splits, uh, you're pushing your bees. You're not making any honey, but you're not making any money on honey anyway. Uh, <coughs> that's what I said. Pay to take my class. Get the discount on supplies and a guarantee. Uh, packages, queens. Get on our email list for updates. And there's a whole I could I could talk from now until sometime Thursday on social media advertising because that has taken over our world. What you do on um, letting people know you exist and the things that you can make available for them, and and save you're saving money because the advertising doesn't cost. You're saving money because you're giving them a deal. Um, you, you give a class for free. The way you teach them what it is they need to know, so there are fewer failures. Very nice secret. They know what you know. <coughs> you keep other people's bees. You don't even have to have bees to do this. You sell them a beehive, they put it on their lawn, you come and take care of it every once in a week, and you get that really rich lawyer who's having a party out of his deck, and he goes, Wow, did you see my bees on there? There's other rich lawyer friends. He gets all of this, they give him all of that. You get the honey or half the honey or some portion of the honey and he pays you to take care of his bees. You don't even have to own them. So you can take care of other people's bees. I like to think sustainable living, intergenerational, all of these things are going to work. And, and I, I keep getting up every day thinking that the world's going to get better. And, and I'm hoping that it does. But a lot of the things that we just talked about are ways for you. Hopefully, to make your life a little bit different, but certainly better. A better way to use bees, a better way to have a beekeeping life and, and make it work for you and your family and the people that you live. So, let your bees get away. All right, cool.